What can we learn from deconstructing the running style of multiple time Ironman world champion, Marinda Carfrey? Let's find out. My focus here on this channel is to provide you with all the coaching tips, tutorials and training info needed for you to become a better runner. If you've been around here for a while, you'll know that I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to running mechanics. We all need a hobby, right? Well, it seems like some of you guys also love to dive deep into the technical side as well. I'm frequently asked to add to the running technique analysis videos already on this channel, like the one I did for Mo Farah a few weeks ago. I'll leave a link to that video in the description. Today I want to take a look at some great footage that coach Matt Steenmetz has provided featuring pro triathlete Miranda Carfrey on a one hour training run off a 100 mile bike ride. Long distance triathletes amongst us are going to know exactly the importance of these sessions and precisely how our legs are likely to be feeling as we watch this footage. Okay, so let's start out as we look at this video from side on having a look at some basics. Let's take a look at posture. Okay, and we can see that when we look at Marinda, particularly as we come through and take a bit of a, a pause here at mid stance, so the point where the foot is underneath the hip, we can see quite clearly that there is that gentle forward lean that we want to see from a nice, smooth, efficient running style. We don't want people to be forcing the forward lean. In fact, the forward lean is going to be a function of pace rather than something I usually get runners to consciously think about. But we start to see that whilst she's holding her torso in a nice upright position, not particularly bent forward at the waist, she's getting that forward lean from the ankle. She's getting that forward lean as a whole body lean rather than what we see from so many runners, which is more of a pitch forward at the waist, more of a kind of a bend in the middle. As she's achieving that, we need to then look at what's happening in terms of stride length and stride angle in particular. So what do I refer to in terms of stride angle? We're looking at this point of toe off or, or really turn off stance where the foot is just about to leave the ground. Okay, and at this point, I want to see the separation that we're getting between lead thigh and trail leg. Again, drawing very rough, rough uh, angles on here, very, very rough lines on here, sausage fingers drawing on an iPad, but you get the idea here. What we're starting to see is the telltale sign that I spoke about in the Mo video, and in fact in a number of different videos that I've created around this sort of sub just subject, is that as we get into this point of toe off, we're starting to see that, that parallel line sign. So the way in which if we draw a line down the trail leg and a line down the lead shin, we're not a million miles away from the parallel lines linking those two body parts, linking those two limbs. What we see from so many um, recreational runners is that at this point, again as I show of toe off here, we start to see that the lower leg of the lead leg is rather than creating this parallel line, or indeed as Marinda showing us here, slightly shorter than parallel, we're starting to see in so many recreational runners that at this point they'd already be swinging that lower leg forward. There's a video that I, uh, I'll leave a, a card up here in fact so you, you can see what I'm talking about, um, but a video where I show the difference between a runner who's overstriding and a runner who's not, and the fact that it's this lead leg swinging out in front of you, the lower leg swinging out in front of you that sets you up to overstride if you're going to overstride. And it's largely a function of the amount at which you create this triple flexed position. What do I mean by triple flexed? I mean a combination of hip flexion, lifting the knee up, knee flexion, lifting the foot up underneath you, getting into this, uh, this elevated position, picking the foot up underneath your butt as it swings through. And the third part of that triple flexion is ankle dorsiflexion. Here Marinda's ankle looks adequately dorsiflexed, not uh, rigidly like you'd expect to see a sprinter, but certainly enough to uh, allow her to get into this triple flex position so that as she comes through onto this next stride, she strikes the ground. If we take between this frame and this frame, as she's striking the ground, here, she's not a million miles away from what we want to see in terms of her landing that foot. So the ankle is underneath a flexing knee, perhaps a little forward, um, but you've got to take into account the fact that we've not got a perfectly steady, uh, steady camera here either as Matt's cycling alongside 
Okay, so it's not a perfect, uh, a, a perfect vertical line, but then again, the ground that we're running on isn't a perfect horizontal either. I'd argue that's still 90 degrees to the ground. So managing to land that foot underneath the flexing knee, and again, if we look at the opposite side, it's gonna be a very similar story as she lands between this frame and this frame is where the load starts to get taken on. This frame, I'd argue she's not fully loading yet. Um, she's just getting to that point where the heel's about to touch the ground and the lower leg is, again, angled slightly. Terrible line that, there we go. Angled slightly forwards. But actually, in reality, it's between these two frames and she, in comparison to so many, again, recreational runners where we see that lower leg flick out in front and they're starting to land almost off a more um, a more fully extended knee, so they're landing way further out in front of themselves here. Again, if we draw, drawing the lines up a little bit, landing further out in front of themselves here, slamming the brakes on, creating that overstriding, decelerative um, load coming back at them. Marinda here is managing to land much closer to underneath that flexing knee, much more efficiently, much more effectively. It makes for a shorter contact time. She's running with quite a high cadence. Um, and as she gets into the position where she's landing underneath that flexing knee, you also see that, again, as a long-distance triathlete, racing over Ironman distances, she naturally is getting to that point where she's not up on the balls of her feet. She's not in this position where perhaps we looked at a, a track 5K runner, um, track 10K runner, perhaps they'd be working on getting that little bit forward into a forefoot position. She knows that she's got um, a marathon to run after 2.4 miles swimming, after 112 miles on the bike. It's that balance between what's gonna be efficient and what's gonna be sustainable, sustainable to allow her to run fast over those distances. She's the course record holder at Kona for the run, the Ironman World Championships for the run. She is, um, she ran that in, uh, what was it, in 2014, it was two hours 50, 26. That's, after a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, that is super quick. Uh, and again, it's finding that form that's gonna allow her to do that given the fact her body is under duress already. That's what I find so interesting about looking at Ironman athletes in particular in comparison to out and out runners. Okay, if we look at uh, the rear on perspective, let's just dial this back for a moment. Getting closer to rear on. What's interesting, let's get a bit further back. As she strikes the ground, let's take her left leg. She comes and strikes the ground. As she loads on that left hand side, so we can see here, foot's not touched the ground yet. As the foot strikes the ground and we get through to this point where the foot's closer to underneath the hip, what we don't see, which we again see from so many runners that we analyze day in, day out here, Kinetic Revolution, is the tendency for, as we load on this single leg here, whoop, no, there we go, as we load, sorry about this, as we load on a single leg here, what we don't see is that opposite side hip drop. Okay, we see that Marinda manages to keep that nice level pelvis, again, as much as we can see through that t-shirt and getting an idea of the contours of her body, as she loads through that one side. And again, as she then loads on the right-hand side, we see that maybe there's a little bit more of a hip drop on this right-hand side. Perhaps we're getting a little bit closer to seeing a touch of a hip drop, but in the big scheme of things, as we roll this forward frame by frame, she's actually got a very stable looking pelvis in that frontal plane, that side to side plane, meaning that there's not gonna be a great deal of what you could refer to as kind of energy leakage, if you like, more wasted energy into that frontal plane, so side to side movement, where we want to be as efficient as possible in those forward and back movements, and particularly driving yourself forward, of course. Um, so again, looking like she's staying nice, and efficient, nice and smooth, with good control around the hips, what you'd expect to see from a good runner. Um, a runner, even in the context of triathlon, who is able to absorb the sorts of training load week in, week out, to get to that high level of performance, um, you know, to get to a point where she's you know, winning multiple world championships. Let's just again fast forward. We'll take another side on view. Okay, and what I want to look at is the way in which, and we mentioned earlier that forward lean, but the way in which she holds her torso nice and upright within that nice quality hip extension that she's got. So although she's creating a lot of hip extension, which is great again for a triathlete, someone who spends a lot of time on the bike, good range of motion at the hip, she's not having to lean 
forwards, which is where we see so many athletes having to get it, get to to try and bluff this hip extension if they're tight through their hip flexors. As they're extending, as Marinda's extending through the hip on this left hand side, so as we see her driving this left leg back, pushing the ground away behind her, using those glutes, those hamstrings to propel herself forward, what we see is a great amount of, um, again, extension here at the shoulder on the opposite side, which creates this rotation. Okay, so we see this rotation. Let's see if I can just come back a couple of frames, get rid of the lines. As we come forwards, we get this side to side swaying rotation, but it's not this rotation where she's in this kind of closed shoulder, rounded shoulder position, closed chest position. It's very much chest open and the rotation is extension and rotation, working in opposition to balance out the extension and the and rotation in the opposite direction that's going from her hip and her, and her pelvis. So she's managing to actually do a great job of creating this nice um, positive rotation through her, through her torso, rather than the negative rotation that we see from so many runners where they get into this position where they're rounded forwards, they're driving their arms across the midline, they're driving forwards. Marinda here, as she's driving her leg back, she's driving opposite side elbow back. And it just looks like this nice, smooth, flowing pattern where we're getting the top half and the bottom half working together nicely. Okay, so as we continue to look through this, what I want to drop back to is this rear on view. Where are we? Rear on view here, getting closer, there we go. Where we've got the white line on the ground as a reference point. Naturally, with a runner running relatively fast, again, I don't know specifically what pace this is, but if you look at this, as we will do in a second, at full speed, you'll see that she's certainly not hanging around. The faster runners are traveling, the closer we're gonna get to a fairly narrow stride width. And with Marinda's stride width, she's doing a good job. If you look at where this left foot lands relative to the white line, and then you look at where this right foot lands relative to the right line, and again, we'll look at it again, left foot relative to the white line, right foot relative to the white line. She's managing to run a fairly narrow stride width without getting into this crossover gate. So we're not getting the left foot landing to the right and the right foot landing to the left of the midline. The two feet are landing to their, their your correct side, if you will. So the left's landing to the left of this imaginary midline and the right to the right. And we can get a sense for that by looking at it um, versus the white line that she's running alongside here. Okay, and we can see if we show that again, where the right foot lands, where the left foot lands. What we see so often from runners is that the right foot ends up landing closer towards the left, and in relative terms, the left foot ends up landing closer towards the right. We get into this position usually when particularly hip stability is somewhat compromised. We already mentioned that Marinda looks particularly stable around the hips, better probably on the left than the right, um, and she's showing that she's managing to create this control in terms of stride width, largely coming from that. And because she's got the control around the hips as well, we see the way in which there's no real side to side bob through the torso. We can see the rotation here that I'm talking about. So as this right leg comes back into hip extension here, we can see that she's driving back through the left shoulder and we get this rotation, this kind of cross body rotation as she drives back in that direction. And now as she's about to drive the left leg back, we're gonna see the right shoulder come back and again, we start to see the rotation in the opposite direction. We see that rotation, but her head stays perfectly smoothly positioned. There's a little bit of vertical oscillation, which you'd expect. Of course, we need to get on to the next stride. There's always gonna be an element of up and an element of forwards within that. Okay, but there's none of this side to side bobbing that we start to see from some runners, where they're expending a lot of energy moving from side to side, which is usually compensation again for poor stability when in this single leg position. Okay, Marinda, good and strong, good and stable, torso nicely forward, um, not, you know, nicely aligned in terms of not particularly bailing out into too, into too much side to side movement. Doing a great job of controlling that. So what can we take from this? In terms of looking at stride length, where we looked earlier, or oh, great still to start on here, 
the way in which Mirinda, for the given pace, is managing to pick her foot up underneath her, managing to lift her knee up as she's coming forwards. She's getting to a point for the given pace where she's lifting her foot sufficiently, she's picking her knee up sufficiently in front of her, so that as that lower leg swings forwards onto the next stride, it's not landing excessively out in front of her, and even at this point with that rear foot's just about to touch the ground, we're not a million miles ahead of the knee, and as the foot loads, we're underneath the flexing knee there. Ideal, not overstriding, fantastic. Again, as we're coming through here, we're gonna see a similar story. So the foot, we can still see a little bit of light underneath the midfoot there. So again, not fully loading. So really, we're talking about this frame underneath the flexing knee. Again, fantastic. Um, she's doing so because of the way the legs swing through underneath the body. The legs swing through underneath the body. She's not shuffling along, she's picking her feet up and allowing herself to then land under that flexing knee rather than over striding. Landing with a gentle heel strike, again, as a long distance triathlete, that makes a lot of sense. We need to find this sustainable form, the form that you can maintain under, when you're, you're pre-fatigued coming off the bike, um, able to maintain this form for 26.2 miles of the marathon. Again, very different proposition to throwing yourself up onto the balls of your feet and running as a kind of Brownlee style, perhaps, um, yeah, 10k. Um, it's where you're right up on the balls of your feet, as as per Aster Brownlee. Um, so it's yeah, completely different proposition, completely different form for the job. I hope that's uh, helpful. I hope that makes sense. I certainly encourage you guys if you've got any questions, any thoughts around this. As we watch through here again, we can see that nice bit of positive rotation through the the, the torso to work with those nice stable hips. If you've got any thoughts around this, please do just leave a comment. Let me know if you've got any questions, anything to add, anything that you want to particularly point out. You can leave a comment, a, long, a time code rather, alongside the comment. And if you found this video useful, please do hit that thumbs up button. I hope you found this brief insight into Marinda's running form interesting and that it's given you some food for thought. Don't forget to subscribe for more running tips and coaching advice like this. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video and feel free to ask me any questions in the comments. I'll be back here tomorrow and I'll speak to you then. Bye now.